This video is about the widening of the rear axle on Toyota 70 series. Is it worth it? And how can it be done? Or should you even do it at all? All right, to start with disclaimer, I'm not sponsored by anybody. I do did the conversion onto this troop carrier. I did a similar conversion onto a previous vehicle. I used a particular product. I will mention it and that product was donated, but I chose it. And I will now present to you, forgive the noise. They've got some guys putting some solar panels on the roof of my house. My entire house is going to be powered by the sun. Okay. So, I, what I'm going to present here is something that I, it is absolutely neutral. I don't have to, I don't have to. The, the deal is, I, yes, I get this stuff free because it's sponsored, because people want me to do videos like this, but it, they don't tell me what to say. And the reason why I fitted this particular product, I'll give you now. But I have driven, I've owned 79, 76, 78. Okay, I've driven them extensively off-road in Africa and Australia and I have lived with and I understand the effect of the narrower rear axle. In 2007 the front end design changed to accommodate the 4.5 V8 diesel engine but all Land Cruiser 70 series with all engines ended up with this front end design change. So to find out if your Land Cruiser has this axle issue, look at the front end design. If it looks like this, then the front axle is wider than the back. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. The difference is 95 millimeters. You're talking that much on each side. Let's talk about, is it worth doing? With the 79, that's the longest of the three wheelbases, we have the 79, we have the 78 troop carrier, and we have the 76 wagon. All right. Three different wheelbases. The effect of the narrower rear axle is different on these three. It has a lesser effect the shorter the wheelbase. The vehicle that is, it is, most, that is most obvious when driving, that it has a narrower rear axle is the long wheelbase, the 79. The effect is the vehicle has poorer than it should directional stability. So those of you who have driven it on, on sealed surfaces may notice that it, 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 you, you do a bit of correction. It's not a lot. It's not bad. It doesn't make the vehicle horrible to drive. It's fine. You just get used to it. And it's a, the, the directional stability is, a, is not as good as it could be. When going off-road, because the track on the rear axle is narrower than the front, it's not ideal, is it? Because the front is compressing the soil in front of the vehicle and the back wheels are not riding in exactly the same compressed soil. They're riding in something slightly narrower. So what happens? The front wheel will compress the soil, create little ridges around where it's compressed, front and uh, left and right. The back wheel now has to do that again on the one side because it's a little bit narrower. That's not good for traction. That's not good for off-road performance. It degrades the off-road performance. The exact measure of how much is impossible to know, but it does. It's there. All right. When on sandy, a sandy ground or sandy track, where you have a lot of these tracks, where vehicles have driven, they've compressed the soil, they've made these little ridges left and right of the tire track, because the rear axle is not settled in the tracks made by your front wheels, the back axle searches for a comfortable place to drive. And you will find the vehicle tends to do this a lot. It is of all... No, there are two, there are two things that, for me, where while driving you notice it right it's right and it's right there because you're correcting the what the one is what i've just described sand tracks the back axle is searching for a comfortable place to run and it does it all the time it's constantly doing this 
and it becomes irksome. It becomes a bit of a, it's not nice. It, it, it's not as if you have to fight it. You don't have to fight it, but it's there. And it will contribute to you getting stuck on soft ground. It will because you've got two separate axles doing two separate bits of work, whereas normally the front axle is doing the compressing and the back axle is riding in it. The back axle now has to do some of its own compressing of the soil. All right. I've driven the 79 in those conditions and I've driven my first troop carrier, 78, slightly smaller wheelbase, in the same conditions. And it did the same thing, but it did it to a far lesser extent. Far lesser extent. I hardly ever noticed it, but I noticed it occasionally. I remember in uh, Namibia in 2016 with Paul Marsh, we did a very remote trip into, into Namibia. And um, uh, we went, we drove through a place called the Chorub Schlucht in the Quirka land, northern part of Namibia. This time I'm in Namibia to investigate remote travelling with a rental 4x4 and all its gear. One of my favourite parts of the world. And it, it, was, it was so pronounced. The vehicle wasn't nice to drive. And that was, that was one of the first times I'd ever kind of thought, why is the vehicle doing this? And then I realised, yeah, it's that. I had owned a 78 troop carrier and I'd owned a 76 my first solo crossing crossing the Kalahari solo was in a 76 it never worried me it never even occurred to me that this was an issue until I got behind the wheel of a 79 the other place where this where the where it affects the Land Cruiser is when towing when towing directional stability is vital because the moment you get the swing you've got this counteraction of a of the tow the, the item being towed so if the vehicle is doing this it's doing this with the trailer and you've got this weight more momentum more kinetic energy moving left to right and which exaggerates the issue so you can be driving on a sealed surface towing you will feel this odd directional stability issue it's uncomfortable and again more prevalent more noticeable with the 79 my second troop carrier I purchased in 2017 I did the canning stock route very tough route and everything and Honestly, I didn't notice it. I didn't notice it. The vehicle performed extremely well with a narrower axle. And I had very thin, narrow tires on that car. And it performed brilliantly. So no problem at all. So if you've got a troop carrier and you're going off road and you're thinking, oh, I've got to, I've got to narrow the, you know, sort out the rear axle because I want to go and do some tracks. I don't think so. I actually don't think you'd have to. I don't think it makes a big difference. Where I believe it will make a big difference, perhaps, in is extremely soft ground. But then again, all of the dunes of the, 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 the canning, the troopy sailed over them. So it wasn't a, big, wasn't a big deal. In 2018, I actually had the product that I now have on this called the Multidrive True Tracker which is a conversion of the axle. The 78 and 79 have the same standard Toyota axle. The 76 has a lower, uh, lower duty. It's not a light, I wouldn't say it's a light duty axle, but it is not as strong as the 78 and 79. I had it done and I noticed the difference immediately. Within 10, 20 minutes, I could feel that my troopy and I was driving on the, on the uh, urban roads around Melbourne it was just a little bit more comfortable to drive it had better directional stability not that the standard one has bad directional I only noticed it when I'd made the change and I thought 
yeah, this is a little bit nicer to drive. So it wasn't a brain, it's not a, it wasn't a, oh wow, why, I'd, why didn't I do this, why didn't I do this when I first bought the car? It was not that. But it did improve the car, all right? I'm doing it with the, my current Troopy because I know now that I want that better di directional stability. And when I'm on soft ground, it will perform better. The logic says it will. But again, if you're sitting there thinking, should I, shouldn't, it's quite a lot of money, mm, think twice about it. Because it's not a deal breaker, because it's expensive. Now the product, there are a couple of products that you can use. And to me, the, the, the best value is the one that I have chosen. Because, now I was going to say you can do it yourself. You, you actually can do it yourself. But, it, but, but there's a caveat there. The, this is their do-it-yourself, in inverted commas, installation kit. And it's beautifully presented. These are the two half shafts. Those are the new hubs. Another hub there. And in here, all the bits and pieces needed for an installation. A DIY installation, because look here, I mean, this is beautifully, beautifully prepared step-by-step -step guide, really professionally done. I thought I might, might do it myself. I could, but here's the challenge. Every one that's done has to be signed off by an engineer. So for me to get my work signed off by an engineer is far more difficult and tricky than having a workshop that has done many of them. Uh, when they get it signed off, yes, they also have it inspected, but the, the, the engineers know them. They know their work. They trust their work. If that wasn't the case, I'd say, do it yourself. But because you've got to get an engineer to come and sign it off, which is going to cost several hundred dollars, you might as well spend that several hundred dollars getting an approved fitment center to do it because they'll do it and they've got a blanket sign off. In other words, they are approved fitment centers and they have a engineer. They've paid for an engineer to come in, inspect their work and say, yes, we're happy with the quality of your work. That's the kit you're using. That's how you're putting it together. We'll sign it off. So when they deliver it to you, it's signed off. You don't have to worry about an engineering certificate. So is it worth doing yourself? I don't know. Might be still. You need to investigate that, but keep that in mind. All right. The process is very simple. You cut off the existing hubs, you lengthen the brake lines, you bolt on new hubs, and you put the wheels back with the corrected. It sounds simple. It's not that simple, but it's also not terribly complicated. But it's also not cheap. You're talking three and a half thousand dollars plus. So it's, it's worth thinking about. The other alternatives would be to replace the entire back axle. Now, if you're doing a GVM upgrade, then I would say definitely worth considering replacing the back axle with one that is suitable for your GVM upgrade. Worth considering. They're heavier. Okay, some a lot heavier. All right, think about the extra weight. Okay, um, it's unsprung weight. It's attached directly to the wheels, so any, making that heavier will potentially affect the ride and the vibration inside the cab. The heavier the unsprung weight, the more harsh the feeling through the cab. Think about that. If you're doing it as part of a coil spring conversion, it's a no-brainer. Do it. Change the axle with, you have to, I think. GVM upgrade-wise, the True Tracker product that I've mentioned has a limitation. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to present the figures now because I might get them wrong, but understand that there is a limitation to that. So if you're doing, say, a 4,000 plus kilogram GVM upgrade, the True Tracker is not going to be suitable for you because it only has a, a lesser approved max GVM associated with the product. So just be aware, do that check, make sure that it's applicable to your, your needs. So now I've helped you with the most expensive and most complicated way of correcting it. Here are some ideas on doing it 
on the cheap and the reason why i say on the cheap is because well to me cheap is never is is never cheap firstly you can say okay i'm going to put spaces now in australia spaces are illegal but not illegal all over the world if you decide to put spaces in and uh, there is a mishap and there is an insurance claim and the spaces are discovered then you could have a big be facing a big liability issue let's put that aside let's just say okay well i'm going to put spaces in anywhere why not well here's why not a wheel bearing a set of wheel bearings are two bearings sitting like this and the load is carried on those two bearings if you now offset the load by spacing the wheel out or in in this case out you're offsetting the load in other words the bearing is not carrying the load equally it will wear the one bearing a lot faster than the other bearing and if you do that the bearing will wear faster if you are driving in very hard conditions and you've got a heavy load you could easily have a catastrophic bearing failure which would never happen if the bearing was running true okay Toyota Land Cruiser axles the bearings are are lubricated with grease not axle oil which means they are even more susceptible to overheating and stress when the loads are off center so in my view it's one of the downfalls of the Land Cruiser axle the design on uh, other makes is actually better because the, the the bearings are actually fed with gear oil from the axle but we live with them and all we do to correct that problem is that we service our bearings a little more regularly than you might do with another kind of system it's not inherently unreliable it just needs a little bit more maintenance which means that if it gets hot it will fail very quickly because there's no oil to cool it the other way of doing it is taking a wheel rim and with a different offset this the Land Cruiser has a zero offset if you corrected the offset and got the wheel to travel outwards it would do exactly the same to the bearing as a spacer however changing the offset is not illegal but of course doing that you would have mismatched uh, wheel rims is that a big problem really I don't, I don't think it, I don't think it's a big problem for example what you would do is you would take your your wider offsets and run them on the back okay and I think that you would be reasonably safe bearing wise legality wise if you went up to but not more than 25 millimeters each side so in other words you would be by doing that 25 plus 25 you would be slightly more than half of the correction I think that would probably make a significant difference to the handling and the problems that I've already discussed and then your spare keep your spare suitable for the front wheels in other words you would have the standard offset on your spare because if you lost a rear tire you could just put one of the 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 zero offset rims on the back and that would be fine after all it's a spare you fix it and put the other one back when you can it's there just to get you going after you've had a flat that to me of all of the solutions here if you don't have a lot of money to spend and you do want to sort this out you can go halfway or actually more than halfway in sorting it out by getting a set of two two rims with a different offset and fit them on the back you've at least made a step in the right direction with really not spending very much money I am putting the true tracker in because I think it is the best value product out there for doing the axle correction hopefully now I've given you a good picture of why you should do or shouldn't do and spend the money on correcting the rear axle issue on your Land Cruiser 70 series thank you for watching I hope this has been helpful for you helpful 
for you. If it has, of course, subscribe. There are lots more like this. And give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the content. See you next time. Thank you so much for watching. 4X Overland is truly independent of sponsors, and that means that our opinions, reviews, and commentary cannot be influenced by commercial interests. Help us stay independent by joining our Patreon family now. Details in the video description.